Welcome to track two, and this is the last session of the day. Uh, we have Eric Landmine, <laughs> aka Eric Lansbury, uh, talk insane in the computer brain. However, before we proceed, I've been asked to make an announcement. Uh, please make sure to visit David's Legacy Channel. Uh, they're a nonprofit to help kids who are uh, who have ongoing cyberbullying. Uh, the, the organization was created after David took his life and, and too many kids take their lives to these online attacks. You can help out no matter where you are in the world with uh, tech education and, and you can help save a life. So go ahead and check them out in Discord. Uh, so let me um, introduce Eric real quick. Uh, Eric is currently serving as a manager of technical services at CISO LLC, a Pittsburgh-based cybersecurity governance, risk and compliance company. Uh, he's known by Eric Landmine via Twitter, and he runs, owns, and operates the uh, Red Up Security Podcast. He's B-Sides Pittsburgh organizer, longtime fan, and longtime attendee of various uh, B-Sides conferences. So if we were live, I'd say put your hands together, but you can do it anyway at home. Uh, without further ado, uh, here is Eric's presentation. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk, Insane in the Computer Brain. My name is Eric Lansbury, also known as Eric Landmine via Twitter. Uh, I run the Red Up Security Podcast, which is a Pittsburgh InfoSec people-based podcast where I interview various professionals in the InfoSec field that have connections to Pittsburgh or currently work in the Pittsburgh field. Um, also, or organizer at the Besides Pittsburgh event, which we'll be having our event in October of this year. And also, I am the manager of technical services overseeing all the red, blue application security teams for CISO. Uh, CISO is a cybersecurity firm, information security firm, and we have tons of red, blue, and GRC services available. So what is this presentation? Why are you guys here? Uh, what, what got you interested in this, uh, this type of talk? Uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about here is the human mind, the computer brain connection, and basically the similarities between how computers were designed and how the human mind actually operates. It's kind of uncanny, so to speak. Uh, this is a collection of my own research, and there are some very conceptual, abstract-based theories that I have that we'll be talking about today. Um, and I'm always open to feedback and new ideas in this space, so feel free to reach out and, and give me some feedback on this stuff. Um, it's really, really about that last line there, how it's not so weird that the computer systems that we have in operation and are designed are basically people. Because people design them. So what this presentation is not, um, we are not gonna be talking about AI. We're not gonna be getting in depth with machine learning. We're not gonna be doing any analyzing of how current AI or algorithms are currently working. So uh, if this is not the talk for you, then maybe I'll spin off an AI based one and maybe I'll even have a human adaptive or assistance technologies one. That could be definitely interesting. Future opportunities. So let's start out just by talking about the, the blaring similarities between any kind of computer system design and the human brain. Uh, so you can see based on this image that's provided by the Ketamine Institute, which has a really good study on these similarities. In the left uh, showing hemisphere you have here, you have your basic computer. Um, operating system is included, Windows or OS X. Um, you have your memory, you have programs that run, and you may have some diseases or viruses, you know, some programs or things that are, are kind of stuck there. On the right hemisphere of this uh, photo here, you see the typical brain. The, the operating system has its default mode network, and we're going to talk about the systems that are involved there on the next slide. And it also has short-term, long-term memory, and different types of behaviors that it reacts to based on context and those sorts of things. Also has diseases, right? So the, co the common computer virus is very similar in a lot of, a lot of ways to um, the human diseases and syndromes that occur. So in this slide, we're gonna talk about the systems of the mind and you can boil it down to two systems that are available within the human mind. And one is system one, which is typically fast thinking. It's continuously scanning the area, receiving context, receiving information, and attempting to process that information on, in a very quick manner. Uh, so it's very error prone in that regard. And because it works pretty automatically and effortlessly, it tends to pull in shortcuts and it tends to look for information and data within the rest of the brain system in order to process that, that particular event or that context. So again, it becomes very error prone. 
Um, it's also really based on experience and experience in this case in the system in system one means belief. So if you experience it, you typically believe it. Whereas the opposite might might be the effect if you have not experienced it or something you're not seeing, you might not believe it in the system. System two, on the other hand, is more for the, the slow thinking process, the very methodic processes. It takes a little bit more effort for um, the brain to be able to analyze information and solve more complex problems. Uh, but it also exercises self-control really well, it requires a logic and justification of the context and evidence that it's receiving in order to make some some better longer term decisions. So you might say that some people have more of a system one brain, some people have more of a system two brain, but in reality, these two systems coincide and sometimes they compete, but sometimes they also provide um, really actual items that make things just better in the long term. Very similar to how computers may have different systems, um, processing data more quickly through different parts of the operating system versus more slowly so they can methodically retrieve information such as like long-term archival and storage, which we'll talk about. The next slide I have here is, is more of a theoretical slide. Um, I commonly use and think in spaces of the different protection rings that are available and designed into computers. So I kind of took a stab at um, what a human brain relates to in terms of the different rings in a protection ring. And the focus here could be on like ring zero, ring zero being the neocortex, it's generating signals, it's creating um, communications to actually interface with things down the road, ring one and ring two, so that it can um, integrate with things like the brain stem and the spinal cord, and then send those signals out to the rest of the nervous system. One thing I was also thinking about was ring three in terms of applications, uh, and I, I generally, generally take this and say, what is the direct correlation between a computer design application such as user experience, user interface, and what cognitive function a human brain might actually be able to interact with those UX, UI. And it's pretty typical that if you have a really complicated UI or UX scenario, that the human brain is not going to be able to interface with it well, and it's not going to be able to send the proper signals to be able to um, operate and communicate with it throughout the rest of your nervous system. You can also think of things like mind mapping software. Mind mapping software is literally designed uh, to exercise your thought process. And that is probably more a system two in the brain that's actually trying to get data onto something that's visual. And as you're creating that visualization, your brain is starting to retrieve different information and improve that map that's going through. All right, so sorting. Uh, sorting is probably one of my favorite topics to think about and definitely one of the more eye-opening things uh, when you consider the thing, the when you consider the tasks of sorting and how a computer sorts versus how a human sorts. Um, humans definitely sort objects and information, whether or not they know they're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. And the prime example is moving from one house to another. When you are moving from one house to another, one place to another, you take all of your things in each of your rooms that are already sorted, by the way, and you put them in boxes. And then on those boxes, you put the name of the room. And now you have your, your objects, your data sorted into those boxes with some sort of index so that you can take them to the next place and know what's in the actual box. Now, not everybody does this. Some people will just take everything, throw it into a box, and then figure out what they need to do once they get onto the other side. I, however, really prefer prefer organized sorting. So I want to make it as efficient as possible. I want to put my objects into a box, label that box. And then when I get to the other side, I want to open that box in the room that it's recommended for, that it's required to be opened in, and then put those objects on the shelves, such as, you know, utensils in a kitchen. I don't want my utensils to end up in my bedroom where I have to now take them and then move them into the kitchen. That's an extra step for me. So sorting is is super important. And computers they all sort, right? And it's a little bit more obvious in how they sort data and processes and electrical signals going through, but it's a direct correlation. It's exactly the same. So when you start to think about how a computer might sort data and sort processes and programs, then you realize you're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis in your daily lives. So the question might be, um, do we sort based on how computers sort or do computers sort based on how we sort? It's interesting. And how could it be improved if computers are sorting the way that we sort. 
So the sorting and um, data retrieval actually tie together. The storage and archival of data, uh, either active storage or long-term storage and retrieval have a direct correlation to how you're sorting that data. And the human brain has its long-term memory and short-term memory. And sometimes you might think about something, you might learn something that sticks and your system too is trying to retrieve it. It's really trying to think logically about what that data is that you stored for whatever period of time. Maybe it's three years ago you had this memory and you learned something and it was stuck in your brain for that period of time. But now it's three years from then and you're in conversation with someone and you just can't, you just can't seem to retrieve that thought. You know, you just can't reach down into that system too and start to retrieve long-term data that's been archived for some period of time. And that's pretty common. Now, there is a few studies and a few theories out there that say you never actually lose memories. They may be damaged, they may be harder to retrieve, or they may be something that could be literally wiped away based on injury or that sort of thing, but technically they don't actually go away. They just get much harder to retrieve over the years. So if you think about different exercises you might be able to do to exercise your system two, exercise your system two side of the brain and more quickly retrieve information, then when you're in that conversation, you won't feel like you're stumbling over your words and you know, starting to think about the data that you did three or four years ago. Now, on the computer brain side of things, the computer function side of things, you might think that uh, something like indexing is very important here because there's a ton of data right? There's way more data, arguably, than could be in any one brain, but maybe you could do that. I don't know. Maybe you have that capability. Maybe we all do. However, there's a lot of data that a computer system has to be able to retrieve and has to retrieve it very quickly. So things like indexing are important. Things like indexing are a concept that help with that quick retrieval um, and sorting as well. You could also think of caching information that goes into a cached area can be clean, but it can also be stored if it's saved for long term. Now, fear is an interesting concept um, that I was thinking about here, and this is a little bit more conceptual, a little bit more abstract than some of the other thoughts that we had here, but fear in the human brain is essentially based on some sort of trauma. Some event occurs, and then it is processed in the brain as something that is either uh, a threat or something that you need to run away from. Your brain needs to figure out how to discern between whether or not that fear is actually safe or, you know, is something that they need to run away from or fight, that fight or flight. You know, there's different cues that will occur throughout the process of being exposed to something that creates fear originally, and then you revisit it at a later time. We don't want this to be technophobia. We want everybody to be able to use technology in, in its regards and everything that's going on. So don't be afraid of technology. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that in the pop culture section. Now, on the computer brain side of things, you could make an argument that the removal of fear, the removal of trauma through new events and new patterns is actually really good for security. And I did put AI there. I said I wasn't going to talk about AI, but this is the only time that I'm going to talk about it is that if you have a function that can actually relearn and remove vulnerabilities from systems in terms of attack paths and those sorts of things, then you're improving security. So at first, it might be a fear. It might be something that you don't know about or something that has been exposed to a system that's actually caused damage. But over time, if there's patching and fixing that goes on with that, then your vulnerabilities decrease and you've improved security. So you're actually removing that fear, removing that trauma from the system. It's very similar in that regard. Uh, any new threats can be adapted to, reacted to, and, and fixed and, and protected against. So this, this thought or this process of fear that's common in the human brain is also common in the computer brain. It's just that the computer has a little bit of a better time dealing with those and adapting to the different scenarios. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, pop culture references and one of my favorite movies, Short Circuit. We're going to talk about this now. Um, so Johnny Five, if you're familiar with the movie Short Circuit, you know that number five was developed originally as a weapon for the military. He is then struck by lightning throughout the movie and essentially his, his program is realigned and he begins to develop more human characteristics as he's learning 
and being exposed to different contexts um, outside of the military environment. So like, why are we discussing this? Because it's essentially a robot, right? Well, um, at the time of release, socialization of technology was uh, a little different. And so in the 1980s, humans were more enthusiastic, becoming more enthusiastic about having technology in their homes. So this, along with the release of other movies in pop culture like Star Wars, which had sentient robots and Blade Runner with their bioengineered robots, it gave a real human characteristics to some of the technology based beings. Right. So it included traits such as like free thinking, sensory reactions and reflexive learning, which all happens in your brain. Now, Johnny Five is a prime example of how complex responses, reactions to his environments and adaptations occur when his computer brain receives input and then generate, he generates a response which is ultimately human rather than more programmatic. His human brain seems to be developing pretty well. So there's another Johnny, Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, he plays a key role in the cross between human brain, human activities, to direct design and integration and usage of his internal computer brain, his storage capacity. So Johnny is actually a recipient of a very poorly designed storage and data transfer system with uh, only protection rings in mind, pun intended. In summary, Johnny stores and transfers data from point A to point B and is met with some physical resistance of those attempting to obtain said data that he's processed, that he's holding and storing and moving throughout his uh, moving throughout the movie. But throughout this process, he's required to dump some long-term memories in order to be the point of data transfer. He actually has to release some of the things that he's learned in his long-term storage, his long-term archival, which he's able to retrieve pretty quickly and be able to remove uh, in order to store additional data for his job. So the human brain element that is referenced here is how quite poorly this data transfer method was designed. And if the common practices uh, of how human brain utilizes contextual information and retrieval control to ensure memories are stored without overwriting in the brain space in order to store new information, you know, if only for a short period of time. So in summary, the Johnny Mnemonic, the movie, while a bit cheeky and a bit um, fun to some degree, uh, really outlined the fact that his storage design was poor. His storage design was not reflective of something of a human brain, actual human brain, which can store data for long periods of time without having to overwrite forcibly. So some more pop culture references. These are notable mentions. The movie Tron, great movie. Um, the obvious pieces to Tron are the direct replications of human-like activities in the programs within the NCOM cyberspace. Um, but each program has a different disposition with regard to handling users. So some will fight for the users, others consider users bad, some are simply utilities or data pushers. These varying program types represent various human roles too in society and act upon human-like emotions, which bingo, are sourced from the human brain. So it would appear that the Tron programs actually, the movie programs actually have working amygdala, which generates emotions of anger and fear, as well as the thalamus, which is heavy and sensory response. So even the hippocampus, which plays a key part in memories is also apparent in programs like Clue, Tron, and Yuri. There's direct correlations between these programs and using human brain interactions with the context and the sensory applications that go throughout the entire movie. It's great. Um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, this is a, another favorite of mine. Um, this is more psychological than it is directly related to the brain, but it does directly relate to the use of technology to identify and alter storage mechanisms within the human brain. So to start, a mapping process occurs, which identifies the bridges between memories, which need to be addressed in order for one to actually forget about an experience, and people seek this out. Um, physical human brains seek out the technology to manage their storage components. So whether it's, whether it's traumatic or simply unbearable to recall, that's what they're attempting to do here. So this is, this is a notable mention due to the need of the mapping and memory removal, removal systems to be well aware of how the brain operates. It needs to function that way. So it needs to know how pieces of the brain operate, digging into that system too and such, um, and how it may be programmed to, to literally carry out that removal process. 
it must think much like a human brain in order to be able to do that. Wally, one of my kids' favorites, actually, well, one of my favorites too. Um, the importance of Wally's character arc overall was indeed designed to show the contextual development and intelligence of a seemingly minuscule type of device whose literal original purpose was to only organize and sort rubble. It was sorting, you know, very human like nature. Ava's, Eva's purpose was also similar, and it was to seek out plant life and return it to the mothership. So these two characters developed their human like output through learning of human based memories, um, such as a scene where they are watching on a TV, people dancing. Um, so there are things developed strictly for human consumption and are designed to be used by motor skills sent by the human brain. And Wally and Eva experience these and they begin to generate some very common human brain related interactions. So to button this one up, we have some key takeaways here. Um, <laughs> computer brain designed by humans. So it has human characteristics by design. Human brain exhibits common vulnerabilities as a computer brain it does. There's very interesting ties there. Computers are literally just humans made of metal and plastic. They need hugs too. And obviously if those computers are fans of heavy metal, I'm a fan of those computers. So, all right, here's my last de facto slide. So how can you find me? My Twitter handle is at Eric Landmine. Um, on my Red Up Security podcast is at Red Up Security. And you can find me at any Permani Brothers restaurant near you because I'm a Pittsburgher and I love Permani sandwiches. Thank you. Hello, I'm Philip Wiley, the founder of the Pwn School Project. The Pwn School Project was founded in June 2018 as a way to offer free education based on penetration testing and ethical hacking to the, the public more specifically the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, this was created out of my passion to educate others. When I was, uh, before I started teaching, I did a lot of mentoring, which kind of inspired me to go into teaching. And, you know, I was teaching ethical hacking at Dallas College. And some of my students towards the end of the semester, the first semester was asking, what, where could they take more classes? Because they're interested in taking it, but most people had, you know, a small budget for training. So, my idea was to get together like on the weekends and, and do some some little workshops, some little hands-on training to help them further their education. So I decided to go a step further and started the Pwn School Project, or Pwn School for short. Uh, the Pwn School Project hosts two meetings per month. They started out physical meetings back in 2018. Uh, 2019, I started offering the Dallas meeting streamed, so that way it opened up to people around the globe to be able to consume this content and help them. And when the pandemic hit, we ended up going uh, virtual with both of the meetings, offering two meetings per month. And we expanded past offensive security into defensive security. Even we had talks on uh, becoming a, a CISO as well as talks on uh, becoming a SOC analyst. Another thing unique to Pwn School is at least far is the area that that I live in where Pwn School is founded in the Dallas Fort Worth area is this this meetup was more friendly to new new people trying to get into the industry and we tried to take more of an educational approach so not only does Pwn School stream uh, monthly meetings I also teach pen testing and web app pen testing workshops at different conferences for different colleges and for different uh, cybersecurity groups. So if you're interested in checking us out, uh, go to pwnschool.com and there's a link to our Slack channel as well as meet up for our scheduled meetings. And I hope to see you at a Pwn School meeting sometime soon. Thanks. Right on. Thank you, Phil. And thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, we will see you next year at Beside San Antonio 2022. Thank you.